Today is February 16th, 2023, and my guest is cartoonist and author Zach Wienersmith. He is the creator of the webcomic Saturday Morning Breakfast Serial. This is his second appearance on Econ Talk. He was last here in January 2018 talking about his book Soonish. Zach, welcome back to Econ Talk. It is very exciting to be here. Our topic for today is a bit unusual. Uh, you have a book coming out called Bea Wolf, two words, first word, Bea, as in the short version of the name Beatrice, second word, wolf, as in the animal, Bea Wolf. I'm excited to say that right now, it hasn't come out yet, but it is the number one release in children's Norse literature. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, uh, no mean feat. Amazon describes it as, quote, a modern middle grade graphic novel retelling of Beowulf featuring a gang of troublemaking kids who must defend their treehouse from a fun hating adult who can instantly turn children to grownups. We're going to talk about Beowulf, your book, but we'll also talk about a lot of other things, uh, poetry and um, life and whatever else comes up along the way. Uh, so let's start with the fact that this book is co-authored with an illustrator, even though you are an illustrator. Can you explain that? Yeah, uh, well, so I am a mere American illustrator. Boulet is a French illustrator, which puts him like an order of magnitude above us. Uh, that That is changing, by the way, but but uh, there's, there's a much deeper French literary tradition. I'm, I'm like only half joking here. Uh, the, the French have a much deeper sort of comics as a storytelling respectable medium. Uh, and, and Boulet is basically top of that, in my opinion. And so like, you know, for a book like this, I could have done it myself, but I could easily point to places where he, I mean, uh, other than his his much higher technical competence, there are a lot of like subtle things he does that I would not have done. Um, so I, I give an example, actually, there's a part early in the book, maybe we'll read later about a, a, a boy who turns into a teenager, and this is portrayed as a sort of terrible thing that's happened to him. And I think if I had done it, I could have illustrated, but I would have made the teenage him kind of gross and teenagery. And it said, uh, Boulay drew him sort of handsome and like it's not so bad that he's a teenager it's, it's, it's very gentle um and i i i just love that it, 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 i would have done it like kind of the stupid bumbling way and he did it in these sort of like gentle you know very french way and um and so it's been magical to work with him on this stuff so the illustrations are spectacular um and uh we can't show that in the audio version of this but it, they are great and you can get online and, and look at and We'll link to the book, of course, and people can look at what what the style is. Uh, but the other question, of course, is why would you write this book? Um, <laughs> Beowulf is an obscure uh, 1,500-year-old poem written in – I don't even know what it was written in. It's been translated many times. It's somewhat Homeric in the sense that I think it was orally delivered by uh, – during its beginnings and it – probably many different versions. Um, and you're riffing on this totally inaccessible uh, poem, uh, at least at the, in its original version, and turning it into a children's book. What were you thinking? Well, so I'm I'm an, uh, an old English literature major, so it's, it, it is part of my working knowledge uh, as a certain type of nerd. Um, but I... Um, <laughs> You know, uh, Beowulf has a reputation uh, such that people who read it sort of get entranced by it. And it does have these magical qualities in part because we know very little about it. There's, you know, for something like the Aeneid, we have something like eight or nine, like, book versions of a manuscript. So for Beowulf, there's one. Um, it was almost lost in a fire. And so we just have this one document. We don't know hardly anything about it. The scribes who wrote down the copy we have don't seem to necessarily have cared about it this much. And yet it's one of the lasting poems in English. Like, nobody wants to read Spencer's The Fairy Queen anymore. Uh, people find Milton very difficult, but people will still pick up, like, the Seamus Haney edition of Beowulf and read the first 30%, which is all monster fights, and kind of mumble through the middle part. And But but it, it, there is something very compelling about it. In, in terms of why I started writing it myself, I actually have a, I have a very particular story, which is I had this idea of doing a kind of joke version where the the, 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 the joke is that it's kids, but they're getting turned into adults, which is obviously worse than death. Um, and uh, and that just seemed kind of funny to me, but it turned out to be kind of rich because it it, it adds this element of sort of transition. Uh, and, and, and the original Beowulf, I think, very clearly is a story about mortality. It's, it's, it's billed as a story about monster fighting, but it's really a story about like, you know, the, the sort of impermanence of life and and uh, and all that stuff. But 
I used to drive my daughter to preschool and we had a 20 minute drive in the morning and my daughter's very smart, but just will not pay attention to me, still doesn't pay attention to me. And, 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 and I, I swear she would ask me a question and she would be gone before the question escaped her mouth. She would be somewhere else as I was talking. Uh, but for some reason, I started telling her this kid's version of Beowulf and she was just utterly enthralled. She wanted to know what happened next. She, you could see her like clenching her fists at different moments, like appropriately. And weirdest of all, when I would sort of, you know, originally, originally I was just kind of doing a sort of like, okay version. And then I started dipping into like poetic techniques from the original, you know, these little things called Kennings and alliterative verse with, with breaks between lines and stuff. And she just seemed to like it more. And it was like, the more I poured on the, the fifth century quality, the more engaged she got. And there, there were whole scenes I was going to cut out, but she, I, I did a version for her and she was so utterly braced by it that I felt I had to keep them. And so I just, I, it just kept going. Um, and, and then eventually I had a, a, a poem I thought was unpublishable. And some, some, through a, a genuine series of coincidences, we managed to, to land it somewhere. Um, and I, I could go into that. It's probably too inside baseball for people, but uh, yeah. Well, I want to go back to the line. I don't mean to alarm you, Zach, but you said she's really smart, but she doesn't pay attention to you. The word but uh, could be replaced by therefore. But you have to be careful. <laughs> Certainly for children, uh, that's not uncommon. Uh, but But coming back to the book, uh, Beowulf, the original, is the story of a king who needs a savior because there's monsters that come out of the lake and dismember his um, his men, his warriors. And so Beowulf is this warrior the king hires to kill Grendel. Uh, spoiler alert, by the way. Just <laughs> if you want to skip the next thirty seconds, because you want to read it, find out how what happens. But but uh, Grendel is this monstrous thing that comes out of the water, and uh, it turns out that that's the least of Beowulf's problems. His real problem is Beowulf's. Uh, excuse me, is Grendel's mother. And I have to just say, we're not going to go into this in any detail, but I want to mention it. Uh, David White, W H Y T E. Uh, wrote a wonderful book uh, a while back called The Heart Aroused. And The Heart Aroused is an attempt, very ambitious, it's an attempt to use poetry to deal with corporate life. A uh, bit of un unimaginable, really, but he's, it's a wonderful book. And he has a chapter on Beowulf. And he argues that what Beowulf can help you see is that lurking below the surface of the lake are your real demons. They're hidden, they're in the darkness. And not only do they come to get you, but there's a mother of those demons, the thing that spawned them, and that is even scarier. Now, I know your book doesn't deal with the mom. It just sticks with Grendel, at least yeah. this for this edition. I mean, I'm sure there'll be a sequel, but um, you want to comment on that at all, or is that too um, – no, that's interesting. Um, so weird. No, no, no. I mean, like I said, we, we we don't know anything about Beowulf. There's no like so we, you know the strong suspicion, as you said, is it's an oral poem, and then it gets written down. But but what what people often don't know, you know, get, gets written down probably in the 11th century, and then it's just kind of in the attic of English literature. And what and for many years it was not considered good. It was considered this kind of weird thing, like like fit for finding references and philology and this sort of thing. And it's, it's generally considered that um, J.R.R. Tolkien and another guy named Kerr kind of said, no, no, this is this is really, really good. And they had their own interpretations of it. Uh, and what's interesting is it makes a great substrate for these sorts of interpretations because we have no idea what, what like their whole parts and it's not clear why they're there. Um, th there's a sort of mystery quality to it. And, and so I, I've, that, that is an interesting interpretation to me. It's not mine. And I, I would say one of the most interesting things I've read about Beowulf is there's a modern perspective that is like, maybe this is just not meant to be metaphorical. Maybe this is just like, you know, to you, the fact that someone dies as a modern person is a universalized metaphor. But in fact, they, the people who have listened to it would have just been like, oh, it's sad that he died, this real guy in the story. Um, so uh, for me, I, I, I take the same interpretation as Tolkien had, which is the kind of story about, he referred to it as heroic elegiac meaning it, it's a story about dying um, and a kind of particular, you might say, northern, or that would have been his word, perspective on it. It's interesting to think this, this idea of, of, of Grendel and his mother as, 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 as sort of metaphor for lurking psychology. I, I, I guess the main reason I'm hesitant, um, 
and I don't want to get on too much of a tangent here, but there, we, we know there's a whole class of Norse stories in which there's just a second monster. It's like a standard storytelling technique. And so, uh, you know, you, you can, you can get, you have to be a little careful. Uh, I mean, I, yeah. you, you can press whatever metaphor you you want onto it because it's your choice. You're, it's how you feel about this poem, but, but there is a kind of anthropological aspect to it. <laughs> now, it is kind of cool though, that, I mean, it's certainly a, a standard modern trope that you kill the thing you think you're you need to kill and then oh my gosh there's this giant thing looming behind it the fact that it's a mom is really unusual and and i think i like that uh interpretation david white and he does a lot more with it that goes on for pages and very thoughtfully I, I just i recommend that book generally it's a it's a lovely book but um let's 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 go back to what you mentioned quickly in passing you said certain stylistic aspects of Beowulf. Uh, there's the alliteration that are what are called kennings, and you're going to tell me what that is in a second. Uh, and then there's sort of the spacing. Talk about what kennings are. Talk, uh, and then read us an excerpt, the opening of, of the of your poem, your book. Yeah. So, so, so one of the things that these old poems do, and there there are several traditions that do it, is they use these little phrases that are almost like riddles, uh, and they get used repeatedly, so you know what they are. But so, for example, a classic one is battle sweat. And if you're a person from this time period and you hear battle sweat, you know they're talking about blood. Uh, that's what they're saying. Uh, or if you hear battle adder is another one, adder like a snake, which means an arrow. I believe that's right. Um, and so one of the games they, they would play and that makes the story very compelling, and I think it still really works uh, as, as, a, as a reader, is you, you come up with these little phrases that allude to something else. Uh, another classic one is... Um, I think seawood means boat. Whale road is, is one of the often used ones. It means the sea. Um, uh, and so uh, it, it just adds a lot of richness to the text. Uh, and it's especially handy. I, I, I know this now. If you're trying to make alliterative lines, that is to say lines that usually have at least two or three words that are important that start with the same letter in a short line, it is very hard to do that. But if you can, instead of like there's a, in, in my book, I, I have a, 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 an original kenning, uh, which refers to a river as a sliding sea. And I needed that S sound. That's the only reason it's called that. I mean, I think it sounds nice. Um, it's very nice. Yeah, I, I, it's one of my favorite just because it's like, it also sounds like a kid thing. It's not just, you know, it, 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 you, you can imagine a Viking saying it, but you can also imagine a kid saying it. Um, and these are, these kennings, these um, phrases, uh, which modern poets, of course, use as well. Mm -hmm. uh, they're typically hyphenated, at least in your book. Uh, I don't know if they're hyphenated in the original. I, I, you know, I'm not an expert in old English. I know in translation, that's usually what's done. I don't know if, if, if a guy in the seventh century would have done that. Okay. So let's hear the opening of uh, Bia Wolf. <clears throat> All right, let's do it. Hey, wait, listen to the lives of the long ago kids, the world fighters, the parent unminding kids, the improper, the politeness proof, the unbowed bully crushers, the bedtime breakers, the raspberry blowers, fighters of fun killers, fearing nothing, fated for fame. There was Tanya, treat taker, terror of Halloween, her costume cash vast, sieging kin and neighbor, draining full candy bins, fearing not the fate of her teeth. 10,000 treats she took, that was a fine Tuesday. And Sean, peace shatterer, shrieked he'd never depart the park, his shame-blasted parents bargained ice cream for silence. But there lay no bargains between lion and lamb. Forty sunsets they stayed, sleepless and sorrowing. And Sonia, foam slinger, shot so many skyward darts, the summer blaze was blotted out, licorice black. And beneath that sun-starved night, no certainty reigned save this, that Sonia would never assist the dark cleanup. Uh, and I keep awesome. going from there, but yeah. <laughs> no, it's, but you sustain that, um, I'll call it bardic, that that over-the-top style through the whole book. Am I mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I've had a number of people who I showed the first chapter to tell me they were terrified to read the rest like it would get boring, and they were surprised that they kept enjoying it. Uh, so that, that was very reassuring. Let's talk about poetry generally. Mm -hmm. um, poetry is a bit out of fashion these days. Um, yeah, I think uh, you're one of a handful of poets to appear on Econ Talk. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm a huge poetry fan, especially for children. 
spent a lot of time reading poems, literally poems, but also rhyming books, Dr. Seuss being an obvious example, but also yeah. one of my favorite books I'll just mention here for children, this, uh, Seven Silly Eaters, magnificent book. Um, and poetry is has a musical quality to it. It seems almost designed when it's rhyming or rhythmic to worm its way into our brains in a way that prose does not. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you think about that, both as, you know, for children and for adults. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, um, I think poetry has gone through a similar process that comics have actually, where it, at least in, in, in our culture, that is to say, like Anglophone culture generally, it is considered either a kind of derelict art form for academics uh, or it is for children. And uh, I think that's unfortunate. It, it, it's funny, it, what, what's strange to me, and I, I, I can speculate about this, but I don't know why, is if you go back and you read a book from as late as like the 40s or 50s, a regular person will pop in some lines of verse just to be like, oh, I, I was reading this recently. Uh, <clears throat> one thing I think about, um, there's an almost forgotten author now, uh, who I like quite a bit, named Lilius Haggard. Uh, and she was like a, a, a woman who just wrote sort of like country writing. And she would slip in little bits of verse. And But that's not the fascinating part. I remember, I, could, I think I can recite it from memory. There's a bit of poetry she, she put in a book and it was um, ad addressed to, I think she said it was addressed to a hawk. And it was, oh, have you quite forgot those flights out resting thought before this homely lot half tamed your pinions? The flowers and the stars were once your only bars and where the north wind soars were your dominions. And the fascinating thing, I mean, wonderful, but also she just put it in. She, the, I remember her saying something like, I heard this recently. And it's like unimaginable culturally, right? You, you, people yeah. don't do this anymore. We don't write letters where we'd say, by the way, I came across this, or by the way, here's a little uh, poem I wrote for you. It was, But for her, it was just normal. It wasn't a flourish or anything like that. It was just a thing she would do. And, and what was fascinating too, is she didn't know where it came from. I was able with the modern internet to find it. I actually bought the book by the guy and all the other poems were terrible. She, she somehow got the good poem. And the other funny part is actually addressed to a goose, which kind of ruins the whole thing. But, um, but you can see it was, it was in, in, engaged in this kind of folk process of sharing stuff. This used to be part of our culture and somehow it got murdered. And I don't know why. And I think it's unfortunate. It's, it's like a whole, it's, it's not just that like a genre went away. It's not like country music went away. It's like music went away. It's a whole type of art uh, that, that no one engages with. Yeah, it's a bit of a mystery. I, um, obviously, we'll, we'll get to this later. Poetry often, not always, but often requires work. Yes. And work is a bit of out of, is a bit out of fashion. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to, I love the poems that I have at my fingertips. I wish I had more. Yeah. Uh, We've talked a little bit about this before on the program, but, you know, last night I was at dinner and I had an urge to quote Ulysses uh, by Tennyson. And I know, I don't know, I probably know 20 lines of Ulysses by heart. I once knew the whole thing. I recited in eighth grade. Thank you, Miss Kadeen, which I mentioned before. But um, it's lovely to have it at your fingertips. I, I looked it up and I read it off my phone, the piece I wanted that was not at my fingertips. But just the kind of thing I love. Yeah, I... Uh... I, yeah, you know, I'm curious to ask. I know you, you, you uh, are now at a university whose goal is to have people actually read the books people talk about, um, and uh, it's an interesting idea. I don't know; it may, may never have been tried. But um, I'm interested in do you, do you force them to memorize? Because that's another thing you're not supposed to do that I think is extremely valuable. I think Harold Bloom said somewhere you you basically cannot understand a poem you haven't memorized. I think that's a little much. But it, but I, I, I would at least say there's there's you will never get deep understanding like like and and part of that's because in order to memorize you have to make sense of it um like because it's very hard to remember something that's just gibberish like you know it would be very hard to remember 100 lines of nonsense but like 100 lines of the iliad is, is quite doable it's uh you know um so yeah what do you all do so we don't as far as i know i i, I can't speak for every faculty member we teach the iliad and the odyssey here and i don't know whether people memorize any bits of it or chunks of it uh, but but here's what's what what your observation reminds me of. Uh, an actor who memorizes, say, Shakespeare for a role has to understand it yeah. to be able to speak it. And as you say, otherwise, just gibberish, especially, you know, in that weird Shakespearean in sort of English, but not the English we speak exactly, mm -hmm. but somewhat related. Um, and to memorize it and to be able to deliver it 
uh, must give an actor, a serious Shakespearean actor, a tremendous insight into the into the meaning. I, I, I think so. Yeah, I, it, it should. I, I, I feel that way. So I've, I've like you, you. I, I've, I've far too few verses committed to memory, but I do have some, and I do feel like what when 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 you read it, it's fine. When you commit it to memory, it's like uh, it's like putting a little room in your personality. Um, mm-hmm. The other thing, like non trivially, by the way, I, I, I imagine a lot of people being hesitant about this sort of thing, but like it's very easy. Uh, to memorize a lot of verse, you'll you'll surprise yourself if you like start trying to memorize something and just add a line a day. Um, you would think you would you would top out somewhere, and it just becomes very natural. It's part of your working knowledge. And um, the the other thing, and this is like getting dangerously close to talking about ROI for poetry, which I don't want to say, but like in a sense, you're on a walk by yourself, and you're not sure what to do with yourself, and you can sum it up this whole story, and you can do it, and there's just there's something very engaging about it. Like you, you don't feel bored. Um, and I, I it, which makes it, it feels almost like it's part of the human brain that that's supposed to be there. You know, I, 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 you know, if you were a farmer in a field a few hundred years ago, you would probably had a large collection of ballads in your head, many of which would, well, most of which would have just been stories. And you just had these and it's just, it's like a quality of life thing. It makes your life better that you can do this for yourself. Well, I, I think that, I think the song does that for a mo- most modern readers. Yeah excuse me, modern, modern humans. Uh, but there's something, I mean, poetry, part of it is, you know, what I'm trying to say here about parenting, I think is, is interesting. If, if I play you, my child, the music of my, the soundtrack of my life. So for my children, I would be playing them Simon and Garfunkel, Bob Dylan, Bruce Springsteen, Van Morrison, uh, some Madam Butterfly, um, some Frank Sinatra a little bit later. Did not like Sinatra when I was young, but loved him and still like him quite a bit. They don't like any of that. <laughs> Very, yeah. and I, 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 I don't know how, what an except, whether I'm a big exception or not, but, or an exception, but I, I think often you know, children, teenagers want their own soundtrack. And their lives are different, and their soundtrack's different. Their friends are listening to different music. There are kids who have old souls and want to listen to Sinatra, but in generally, they generally want their own music. And and so, what the music that my kids got immersed in that that was mine tended to be uh, musicals that spoke mm-hmm. to them. Wicked Hamilton. Uh, and, and so Les Mis, those, those that would be our big three. And then, um, you know, a little bit of Bare Naked Ladies um, and some other fun songs that we, we loved. But poetry is totally different. Yeah. Uh, so poetry, they have as part of their soundtrack, but it's just not with the melody. It's their own melody. So all I'm trying to say in a long roundabout way is that I think it's nice to give your kids poetry because they're more likely to take it with them than they're likely to take your um, your favorite music of your teenage years, say. Whereas the poems that you loved as a child because your parents read them to you, you may love uh, – they may love them just because you read them to them. You read yeah. those poems to them. That's, I wonder why that is, though. Like, uh, why, why why should music be so temporal and, and poetry has this – I mean, I guess because they can apply their own way to sound it as part of that. but. Uh... That's, a, that's an interesting point. No, I think, I think the reason, actually, I don't think it's so different. Uh, I think most of the poems, my, my dad loved Keats. Sure. I have a lot of trouble reading Keats. I, I can <laughs> read him a little and I like to read him, you know, as to remind me of my dad. But the poems I love of my dad are more, that my dad read to me or told me about were more like Kipling, which yeah. are rhythmic rhyming poems or Lock and Bar by Sir Walter Scott. Um sort of uh, what what are sometimes called story poems. Mm-hmm. And and those those tend to stay around unlike uh, I think the music part. Yeah, yeah, Kipling is is a, a very good example I think. So my understanding is he would literally listen to folk music in his head and sort of tap on his table as he wrote and you can you can so there's there's 
I, I don't recommend it because it's not for everyone. There's a guy named Peter Bellamy who actually tried to reconstruct what he might have been listening to and sing it with it. It's not beautiful music. It's very <laughs> English, very, uh, you know, screaming, bleeding, shouting ballads. But but you can sort of, you can almost feel like you're you're in a, uh, you know, you're, like you're really there dying of cholera too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kipling's an, an interesting one to me because he's obviously... Being an arch colonialist is, is 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 very much on the outs now. But you you just he's he's so unreasonably good um, uh, at, at just the sound of words. Uh, you know, I mean, he's like like is you know like the only Kipling people know is if, which I consider to, like to be fairly mediocre Kipling. Um, like it's, it's it's Kipling doing uh, you know uh, life advice like uh, be be your best self type of stuff, which is fine because it's Kipling. He's the best at it. Um, but, but there's so much more depth there. It's almost astonishing. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah. Kipling is one I I have memorized a a bit of, um, he's, 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 I actually, I think I, I, no, not in this one. I, I I was planning to steal a line from him. If I get to do a sequel, there's, um, there's a poem he wrote called gentlemen rankers, um, which is just, yeah, yeah. So one, one of the very best poems ever written to my mind. And there's a part that I'll, I'll probably get this slightly wrong, but it goes something like, um, Oh, if the home we never write to, and the hope we, and the oaths we never keep, and all we hold most distant and most dear, uh, should cross the snoring barrack room and return to wake our sleep, can you blame us if we soak ourselves in beer? And here's the really good part: when the drunken, when the drunken comrade mutters, and the great guard lantern gutters, and the horror of our fall is written plain, every secret self-revealing on the aching whitewashed ceiling, can you blame us? if we drug ourselves from pain. Um, and so, uh, and so I want to be clear, it's every secret self-revealing, that self-hyphen revealing, every secret is revealing itself. as the, So the, the theme is there's this guy, he's a gentleman ranker, meaning he should have been in a higher social status in this weird 19th century British system. And for whatever reason, either his parents were broke or there was some fall from grace, he's now with the regular man. And this is, you know, like an impossible position to be in in this culture. It's 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 hard to relate to in specific now, but I think it's very easy to relate to in general that feeling of like be, being not in the place you you thought you would be, and and that scene of him, you know, looking at the ceiling, every secret self revealing. It's it's like I, I, like only Kipling. It rhymes and alliterates, and it's this like you could see his like all of his shame is just dancing above his head. Um, and so I was, I was planning to steal that line, every secret self-revealing, but I don't know where to put it. I just want it. Uh, let's talk about the original Be- Beowulf, the yes. uh, 1500-year-old poem. Is it worth reading? Oh, yes. Um, uh, ab- absolutely. I mean, Beowulf is worth reading. We, that clearly, we've clearly. established. But <laughs> Beowulf. Yeah, let me talk about that. So what is Beowulf? Beowulf, like you said, is, is an oral poem, we think. It has elements, like, so we think that because it has elements that are oral poem-ish, um, but we don't know, uh, but it seems plausible that there was this story that, you know, probably had its origins in a lot of different traditions somewhere in medieval northern Europe, and in the 11th century, uh, the version we have gets written down, probably copied from a copy of a copy. But anyway, it's a story it is usually presented as a kind of monster fight in three acts, which I think is basically wrong. It's how you how you will mentally condense it if you read it is uh, there's this uh, the Hrothgar the king builds a great hall. Then this monster from hell, uh, Grendel, comes and trashes it and eats a bunch of his friends. And this is very sad. Uh, and um, and they don't know what to do. And for 12 years, everything is sad. Uh, and then this guy Beowulf comes over the sea and he's just stronger than any man. And he rips the monster's arm off to kill it. And then, uh, you know, the, his mother comes and gets the arm back and, and I think eats somebody while she's there. And um, and then so Beowulf has to go fight that monster alone. Um, and then the next part that people remember is usually later. Then you flash forward. Beowulf is like seven years old about and he has to fight a dragon. And it's his last fight. There's actually a huge middle part. To most people, is fairly baffling. Um, it, it's very you know, so. Beowulf is just rife with what are called digressions, um, uh, but that's controversial. There's a, there's a guy named Kevin Kiernan who's one of the top scholars on this, and he 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 said you shouldn't think of them digressions. They're just stories inside the story. But if you think of them as a like digressions, the, the whole thing does doesn't work because they're a huge part of the the percent of this story. Um, but let me not get on a tangent. So the one the thing I want to focus on that makes this story really fascinating is. It, it's as if you were watching like 
don't know, Die Hard or Rambo or something. It's a kind of straightforward monster story. I mean, beautifully told, but basically a fight story about, about a, a guy who can beat up monsters. And then all of a sudden he's old and he's still strong, but he's not what he used to be. And there's a kind of uh, last fight he has to perform. And the very best scene in it that people you know, don't remember because they just want to think about these monster fights is this part where Beowulf, the old king, goes out with 11 men and they're supposed to stand by him because he has done all the right things. He's given them treasure and he's, he's stood by them and he's told stories with them. They're friends. They all check out. They're all too afraid and they leave him. And 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 except for one guy and who's not and named Wiglap, who's not, you know, you, you don't get the sense that he's a particularly tough guy, but he has a sense of honor. And he, he, the best to my to my mind, the best part in the whole book is Wiglap saying, you know, basically, how dare you? Like wear the armor he gave you as you walk away from this fight, he's going to die in. Um, and they go away. And so, like I said, you could take an anthropological view and just say, look, this is just a thing that happened and it's a very human like story. But if, if you want to get into like metaphor for me, like if you've ever done something hard, you've had that feeling of like, I thought we all believed the same thing together. And it turns out everybody else was faking. Um, and I, I, you know, like if you ever tried to make like an art project, you, you might find yourself surrounded by people who profess their love of art. But when, when the chance to, uh, to make an extra dollar comes, they're not standing beside you anymore. And I, I love that scene very dearly. And I, I, I'm hoping to make a sequel just to have a kid yell that at some other kid, how dare you, uh, leave when it got most difficult. Um, and so that that's what takes it from just kind of like a meat-headed monster story to like a really beautiful story. And ultimately, Beowulf is killed. Uh, it's another spoiler alert. He's killed, and you don't get the sense that it's going to be okay. That's, that's what's so wonderful about the story. The, the Almost the last line before the last stanza, Beowulf is set on a pyre, and it burns, and they're surrounded by enemies who know that their champion is dead. And there's this, the, the line, it's always translated the same way. The line is, heaven swallowed the smoke. And you're like, man, you know, you can't you can't end an American movie that way. Heaven swallowed the smoke. That's it. Like like the insouciant sky uh, watches as doom is about to unfold. And then the women are wailing because they know what happens to to women when the uh, war comes. And it, and that's the end. Um, so it's it's it, 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 it's a story that's like, like I said, it's as if you had Rambo for a while and then all of a sudden Rambo is reckoning with what it means that this was all in some sense pointless. Uh, and uh, it's just beautiful. The line that comes to my mind is, um, do not forsake me, oh, my darling, do not on this our wedding day, which is the theme song for High Noon. And High Noon is that story, right? High Noon is the person who has a duty to yeah. defend and to to live, and uh, he stands by it. And everyone else, at least in the short run, no spoiler alert here. I mean, no spoilers here. The, everyone else runs away, and he is alone facing the demons, the dark side, the the bad people, and um, that's what that movie's about. It is interesting that Beowulf's never been made into a Marvel movie or yeah, some there, kind there of was, movie. There was a movie. There was, there was a movie. There was, um, I think in 2007, uh, there was one written by Neil Gaiman and one other guy. It's, it's it, the, the CGI has not aged well, and they actually pretty substantially changed the story, but the, there, is, there is a movie – um, it, it's it's not really Beowulf exactly. It's it's pretty deviates pretty strongly from the original. But I, this, is, this is a whole conversation we don't want to have. But uh. <laughs> it's it's Bay a Coyote. It's not really the same. Uh, it's just, yes, right. Anyway, I, I got it. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> now we just did a. Um, I just did a riff on High Noon, um, and it it raises the question of why we should read a book like Beowulf or a book like The Odyssey by Homer um, that is, quote, old. Uh, you know, we make our students read it here at, at Shalem. And I, uh, when I asked one of the faculty if it was hard to get students to read the Iliad, say, they said, well, all of our students have been in, you know, like, why would you read a book that old about some Trojan War that thousands of years ago and yeah. And they said, well, all of our students have been in the army and they really can relate to vengeance, yeah. courage, death, fear. <laughs> yeah. That's what that book's about. <laughs> um, post um, trauma, uh, PS, what is it? Post PTSD, post traumatic PTSD. Uh, po what does it stand for? Post traumatic <laughs> stress disorder. Yeah. 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 That's it. 
Just yeah. that's it. Thank you. I wanted to get syndrome in there. It's not. It's disorder. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so they can relate to all those things, and um, it's timeless. Mm-hmm. So is, is Beowulf timeless? Is or, or is it just cool to read this kind of book because it's still in print? Why should I, we read it? I, I think if, it, like I say, if it just had the first, so to speak, half, it's not. It is, but, uh, let me not get into it. But if it just had the first like monster fights. It would be like a fun story because it has this last part where you you get him as an old man. Um, there's more to it. There's also a part where he remembers it. Actually, a, an often forgotten portion. It was particularly beautiful. A kind of poem in the poem is about this thing in, uh, where there's a king and one of his sons accidentally kills the other son. And there's a poem, we don't, well, we don't quite know what it means, but one interpretation is that it, it's describing a similar situation, which is a father whose son is a criminal who gets hanged. And the sense of it is this feeling of someone being killed. Uh, so so you, 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 the loss of your child, like a, the most emotionally traumatic thing you can imagine, but made worse because you can't observe the normal rights. You can't do what it takes to sort of make peace. Um, and that to me, that's a very Norse poem feeling. Uh, th- 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 there's this... I think maybe it was Kerr wrote somewhere that like the the uh, there's another line I want to steal and I, I he didn't say it quite this way but he said something like uh, uh, you know hopeless um, struggle is is made perfect right right made perfect by hopelessness uh, so the idea is like in in these Norse stories you know that doom is going to win it's not going to be like a Marvel movie eventually doom will overtake the world chaos will win night will fall and so you know how how does any of this matter in the meantime. And the way it matters is that you are that, that that you view the hopelessness of the situation as what makes the struggle perfect. It's not something you're doing to get uh, ten bucks. Uh, you know, it's it's like there's there's a moment when Beowulf has slain the dragon but been mortally wounded. It's a little off putting when you first read it because when he turns to the one guy who stayed with him and he says, "Could before I die, could you show me all the gold the dragon had?" Um, <laughs> which is a kind of kind of a weird thing to do. Show, show me the big bucks we just made. But what he's actually doing, and it says this in the poem, I believe, is you know basically it's, it's a sense that all these people will be taken care of, even though they just betrayed me. Um, and that's the kind of like struggle with and hopelessness that I think you can draw from it. It's, it's, it's to my mind, it's much more beautiful than if, if you watch a, a Marvel movie. It's, it's kind of you know the, the point is we had to get together as friends to save the day. And, and in Beowulf, it's you know ultimately Beowulf is put on a pyre. And there's an even chance everyone he tried to take care of who just betrayed him will be killed. Um, and that's just the end. Um, and and what, to me, I mean, you can interpret however you want, but I, what I love about that is if you know doom is enfolding you eventually, there, there is no way out, um, then it really matters that a sword was broken in a fight with the enemy, right? Because it's just going to happen now. It's kind of forever because it's limited in time, right? Like, like it's not like... You're going to get some eternal reward out of this. I mean, you might might say in a Viking sense, you'll get eternal glory. And of course, these people were Christians, so they had some belief that there was going to be an afterlife for them. But there is this kind of like, it's this pointless doom cycle. Um, so just you, you sort of do what you can while you're here to to protect these people. Um, and so that's to, to me, the, the really pretty thing in Beowulf. It's cool. I was also thinking about the... Um iconic nature of of storytelling and and uh. the handful of themes there are and something really beautiful about the timelessness of certain types of stories mm-hmm. and to understand where they came from that they came that we actually have some of the original stories it's why you should read the bible i think whether you're religious or not it's why you should read shakespeare it's why you should read homer maybe it's why you should read beowulf because we're all the children of the of those works of art. Yeah, I, I think actually Beowulf. What I suspect is probably the original story, or one of the original stories, uh, which you still see. It's like the same story you get in a kung fu movie now, which is you set up two characters who are known to be invincible, and then you just keep talking about how they're invincible, and now they have to fight. And I think you know, as social apes, that is a very compelling uh, <laughs> story to hear because it's kind of like who's going to be in charge of us. Um, so like like that is that that story is so all over the place you don't even notice it but it's like every every single kung fu movie ever made is there were two invincible men and we'll, let's see who's more invincible now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, talk about the fact that you your book is not a morality tale. Uh, somewhere in at least Western art, 
it became acceptable to tell stories to children that didn't merely lift them up, that didn't have a moral lesson. Um, most of Western literature, certainly for especially for children, is supposed to inculcate moral values. Uh, yes. Your book's about fun. Is that just like a marketing trick, Sam, or <laughs> do you want to make defend it more broadly? I, I, I want to defend it utterly. I, I should say, I think that is a kind of English and American quirk. I think if you pick up a French kid's book, they, they, I mean, it's not, not that the French don't do that sort of stuff, but it, but but it's much easier to find a book where the kids are just kind of, like, I mean, Pippi Longstocking is that way, right? Pippi Longstocking, I mean, she, she has a kind of value system, um, like something like honor maybe, but, but it's not like she tells you to brush your teeth. It's just the opposite. And um, so it was actually, to me, it's, it's important. I think it's, I'll get this slightly wrong, but I think Joyce was the one who said there are three kinds of, of books. There's, uh, I think the way he said it was in a very Joycean way, he said there's propaganda, pornography, and then the rest is art. And so so meaning like propaganda is brush your teeth, don't be racist, you know, stuff I believe. And I voiced on my kids because that's what one does. Uh, and, and, and pornography, he just means like stuff that you do because it's fun. Um, and then there, there is, there is, there is literature, which is the other thing. And in the U S I think we mostly have propaganda. Um, even stuff that's aimed at teens is almost invariably pushing morals, pushing morals, pushing morals, uh, in, in a way that's, I find very disconcerting. I remember reading, if you read Boswell's diaries, uh, you, you, like he will go to a play and he will write in his diary, it was a good play because it had this message that blah, 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 blah. And he, which is like, I thought it was very foreign, but I think it, it, it's 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 still there. By the way, complete hypocrisy too. He was meanwhile doing bad things in alleyways in London. Um, and I think that's what a lot of us are doing now is we're, we're, we're foisting propaganda on our kids. We don't do it to ourselves. That's the other thing. Like, can you imagine if you're watching Star Wars and Darth Vader turned to you and said, by the way, colonialism was bad. And like, it's like, we all agree colonialism was bad, uh, but if you can't tell it with a story, it's not good media. Um, and, uh, and so I, I, I do this stuff. I give my kids, you know, uh, media that, that pushes values because I believe in them and that's what parents need to do. They're, they're, uh, but like, I, there needs to be a place for just like actual art for kids that gives you that expansive art is good feeling. I mean, that's, that's the place we're all ultimately hoping to get. I mean, I, I would even say, you know, part of why it's bad to be anti-Semitic is you're circumscribing people's ability to go make those good things that make being a human worth doing. You know, like like it's not an end in itself. It's I mean, it's a good thing to do, but the end is that people are like free to do things that that really matter and that last. And so, so you know, I, I, th this book is is not teaching any values. I mean, the kids have values, but they're values like you know, sharing and 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 uh, like candy. Meaning, Candy. Yes, candy. That's right. <laughs> they're, they're oriented around getting what is good, and they have a kind of honor system, but it's not any kind of recognizable universal value system. But 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 to me, like what I wanted, and and hopefully get toward it, is that this is like Beowulf, ultimately a story about like uh, living well, knowing that this is all going to end at some point. Right. So so to make you you can't kill people in a kid's book, or at least you have to be careful about it. The, the, the point is, these kids are going to lose their childhoods and it's just going to be over for them. And they know that. And so they are having this kind of like idealized, get it perfect childhood uh, under the specter of doom. Um, and so that that is what I wanted to give. I don't care. I mean, like I, I do care about being good to the environment and brushing your teeth and all this stuff. I tell my kids this stuff, I do. But there's this other thing, uh, and kids need it too, the same as adults do. That's sweet. Uh, for those looking for an earlier uh, antidote to uh, moralizing, uh, I recommend The Storyteller by Saki. Uh, it's a masterpiece, mm -hmm. and uh, it you, you will like it, uh, Zach. It, it is consonant with your... Uh, Anti-value values. I, I think. I think it's a really. Actually, I think it's a really good point. Um, if we nag our kids all the time, by the way, we'll often turn them into something that's the opposite of what we want because they'll get tired of being nagged. Yeah. And certainly, there's a room for joy and delight and um, something uh, something sweeter. Uh, yeah. Now, one of the things you mentioned to me uh, before we did this interview is that this book, writing this book, helped you focus. Yeah. Uh, explain. Yeah, I, it's, it's something I've been thinking about more and more lately. So, um, 
you know, we all have this problem now where we have trouble focusing, right? Uh, because there's so much awesome media. And I, I would I would say more a lot of the media we consume is designed by the platform to kind of break down attention span. Because one, one of the things that's very counterintuitive to me, except it's obviously true, is that you can increase people's engagement with something by destroying their attention span, right? So if you've ever uh, been on TikTok, it's it's like magic. You, 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 I, I read uh, the average time spent on a video on TikTok is under four seconds, right? So it's a complete breakdown of uh, attention span, which I think kind of counterintuitively increases engagement, it makes you stay because your attention span is destroyed. And, and so the question is, how do you get back from that? And of course, there's an obvious answer, which is like tune out of social media, but um, that's hard to do for a lot of us, you know, for, for some of us, it's for business, but also it's just, it's a way you connect with people. Um, I think it helps to have something where you have no choice but to tune in. Uh, so I, I got thinking about this. There's a book by Francis Sue, and I'm I'm embarrassed I'm blanking on the title of it, but he made a really interesting argument, which was was about why do we do math? Why do why do pure math? Why study math if you're not a mathematician? And one of the arguments he made is that the act of studying mathematics inculcates basically everything we think of as a virtue, things like patience, humility, um, you know, struggling with a difficult concept. It also teaches community because it's very very hard to teach yourself unless you're like Gauss. You can't just do it. Probably not even Gauss could, right? You need the community. You need to rely on other people. Um, basically, just about any virtue you can think of, making yourself uh, learn, you know, number theory or something does it. And there's a lot of stuff that works this way. I think poetry is a really good example, though. You mentioned Shakespeare earlier. Shakespeare is known, I think of Shakespeare as density without obscurantism, meaning like you do have to sit and see what he's saying, but there's no attempt to like befuddle you like there is in some modern poetry. There's no attempt to be so confusing that you can't figure out, you know, how brilliant this man is. It's um, not like Hegel, who supposedly would lecture on purpose incoherently because he knew his students would then struggle to try to figure it out. It's like a cruel... Yes. Uh, ho uh, prank. I don't, yeah. I don't know if that's true. I apologize, Frederick, uh, if, if I've been unfair to you, but I did hear that from a philosopher once. I've, 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 heard, I've heard that story too. And I also, I mean, I, as someone in the arts, I, I know people who do this. Like, it's just, it's you, the, the way, if, if you don't, if you don't have genius available, it's, you can fake it. Uh, I think, I mean, we all do this to some extent, trying to sound smarter than we are, but like, um, uh, you know, but, but, but Shakespeare generally is not inscrutable in that way. He'd be inscrutable because he's speaking like, uh, you know, he's speaking modern English, but it's an earlier version of it. So there are words that are, are, are misleading. And then also he just, you know, he, he likes to be very dense with language, but so if you want to understand a Shakespeare sonnet, I got very into this because I did a joke book about Shakespeare sonnets and I was surprised that, you know, you can't tell a joke about something unless you've actually understood it. And so I actually ended up to, to make a joke book, reading these sonnets very carefully and reading commentaries. And it's really enjoyable. And you can't tune out. You can't check your email halfway through because you'll lose the thread in a way that's not true. You know, like I love reading P.G. Wodehouse. He's wonderful. He's one of my favorite authors ever. But you can tune out. You could probably miss half a chapter and still basically know what's going on, <laughs> you know? Um there's a lot of filler, and that's okay. That's that's why part of why I enjoy it. But 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 Shakespeare, you can't, not, especially not in a sonnet. And I think poetry rewards you this way generally. Like if you really want to understand it, you have to sit, and you have to not be listening to music, and you 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 have to not be talking to anyone. You have to turn off your phone. And so, in other words, instead of just saying I'm going to turn off my phone, which is very hard to do, um, you can engage in an activity like reading poetry that has these other rewards, but also compels you to engage in things that you yourself probably see as virtues, like patience and humility. Grit, determination. Yeah. Uh, what What is sometimes called sitzfleisch, the ability to keep your bottom attached <laughs> to the chair. But the problem is, Zach, the problem is we just give up. You know, if, if I'm trying to read a Shakespeare sonnet, and this is a virtue of Beowulf, by the way, over Beowulf. Beowulf is is very accessible and flamboyant and bombastic and exuberant. Yes. So it's easy to enjoy. At the same time, it's not uh, totally light. That There's stuff going on there uh, verbally that's delightful. But if you tell me, I want you to grapple with the Shakespearean sonnet so you can understand Zach, Zach's uh, <laughs> really uh, entertaining jokes about it. I'm just going to probably go back to TikTok is what I'm worried about. Yeah. Uh, isn't that a problem? Yeah, I sure. But um, I, I mean, I know you're, you're, you're trying to lead me to, uh, to, uh, to give a speech here and I'm happy to give it, but uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think what it is is the, the reason your attention span is so easy to destroy is just simply that 
Like if, if, if you woke up at six in the morning, which, which I do because I have small children who are vomiting, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and you just got down with a piece of paper and you said, what would I have liked to have done with today? You would never, ever once say six hours of, of Instagram. You would never know. Maybe there's somebody. I, I, I long to be so retired that I could write that down and execute and feel good about it. But I think very few people feel that way. Um, and maybe that doesn't mean they want to learn Milton. I think maybe they should. <laughs> Um, but, 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 but if you, if you sort of wrote down the things you would have liked to have done, maybe it's not Shakespeare science, maybe that's not your thing, but, but the things you would write down are substantially different from the things you would actually do. I, I did a joke about this. I, I've been thinking about this a lot lately where, you know, this old question of, um, was it Nozick who proposed the idea of would you get in the engagement box and have an unreal life experience? The, ex the experience machine. The experience it's machine. It's in Anarchy State and Utopia. That's right. And um, I'm giving a talk tonight and I'm quoting it. So I'm, I'm referencing it. So that's weird. But go ahead. Yeah, Zach, that's, that's keep going. yeah I, it's funny. I called it engagement box because uh, that's what we do now. But I, so my joke was it's, it's funny. It's, I, in the modern world, I almost feel like it misses the points because it's like, would you get in or not? Well, separate from whether you like it's because it's an ought question. Ought you get in the box? But there's this other matter of would you get in the box if it sort of wheedled its way into your life? Do you know what I mean? I think there's an argument that effectively, you know, if you find yourself on Instagram or whatever, just three hours a day, you are in the experience machine. And yet, it, it, but it's weird. It's not, you know, when people talk about the experience machine, I think they're imagining sitting on the beach with like uh, a beautiful partner and uh, some, someone serving you daiquiris. But actually we, we will invest in this false universe uh, or something we don't even find rewarding. Like most of us will trip into the uh, <laughs> into the machine without wanting it. Um, and so it's, it's sort of like most, I think most people when they, they encounter this idea of Nozix will say, no, I would never get in it. I don't know if I believe them. Um, but, and yet we do it uh, at least part-time. Yeah, and, and it's kind of... Go ahead. No, that's part of what my talk's about. I think, I think the... Um, and the experience machine, just for those who don't know it, it's... You you climb into a tank with electrodes attached to you, and you can pre-program it to experience anything you want. Uh, you can feel like you're president of the United States. You cure cancer. You're a rock star. You're, you're or you're just sitting on the beach. Whatever it is, and um, you'll feel as if it's real. And I like the verge. I made. I think I made this up, but you should just you could do it for the rest of your life, and you would just it it, it elapses in real time. So when they unplug you, you're dead. And you, in it, for the rest of your, your living, until you're dead, you, you have this sensation of doing these things, but you don't actually do them. And, you know, I used to, Nozick used that example because in, in 1974, when he wrote the book, of course, no one would hook themselves up to that. And yet I have seen people talk about it in modern times, meaning in the last five years, where they ask a group of people, would they want to be in the machine? And, and a bunch of hands go up. Of course, mostly younger people. Uh, and, and, the ought uh, is, is just ignored. It's just that that sounds fun. I'm in. <laughs> uh, but your insight that that much of what we do today is the equivalent of that is, um, is of course, true. We spend, you know, I, we were talking poetry earlier, whole time. One of my favorite lines, I don't totally agree with it, but it's a beautiful line, is Wordsworth. He says, the world is too much with us getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. An attack on commercial life or materialism. Yeah. And, you know, I did a modern version uh, the other day on Twitter, uh, uh, clicking and scrolling, lay, lay waste our powers. And we spend a lot of time doing that. And then you get the little notification. You spent an average of seven, 17 hours on your phone <laughs> this week. That's 20% more than last week or the ver reverse, and you feel good about yourself or worse about yourself. It's quite fascinating that we struggle to um, to lead the lives we want to lead. lead. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 unfortunate. I, I, like I say, I, I think most of us are too weak. I include myself in this to completely say, I'm just I'm just going to nope out. And, and also, like, you know, there's, there's real value in these things. I don't want to, like, gainsay that, right? So, like, I, I've been working on a research project for a few years, and it's very useful for me to go to Twitter and say, hey, does anyone know where I can pull a paper on this topic? You know, and so like it's this it's this weird thing. It feels like reaching into lava to get some like treasure out. You know what I mean? Like I can I can engage with this thing. I know it's going to destroy my attention span. That's what it's designed to do. And it works on me. 
but man, I, the, the stuff I can get out of it is so tremendous. Um, so I, I, it, it's a tough balance. And th that's, again, where you, you come back to poetry and mathematics, and I'm sure there's other stuff like this. I've heard some people say it about some, some types of athletics, too. Uh, that seems to me to be a bit different, but a similar sort of do something where you have no choice, where if you lose your attention span, you lose. Um, and, and, and I find it really gives you something back. I, I've started, this is, this is a slightly related thing, but it's like when I, I, I do a lot of illustration and when I draw, you know, I can't, it's hard for me to listen to an audiobook or something while I draw. It has to be very light. And so I, I'll listen to music. And now I will, if I listen, if my rule is if I put on music, I have to listen to the whole album, even if there are songs I don't like and that sort of thing. I'm just, you know, ways to sort of claw back your attention by kind of focusing more on the thing that's happening. Um, and so, so poetry is much, much more powerful, I think. Uh, but, but, you know, there are lots of ways to do it. Well, I, I have a son taking a, a class on Milton right now and he loves it. Yeah. I can't read Milton. You've, confessed similarly. I, I've tried to read Paradise Lost, can't do it. I even have a book that he happened to have bought before he took the course called it Reading Paradise Lost. It's supposed to help you. And I tried a little of it. I got a little out of it. But the idea that there is a master teacher or a master trainer who yeah. with their help can open this an inaccessible world that is too hard for you to enter on your own. So you want to do a triathlon but, you know, it's just you try, you start and you're like, it's impossible. You try to read Paradise Law, it's impossible. But, if, but you're, if I tell you over here is a class you can take online or over here is a, uh, an instructor you can hire and they will open up this treasure chest for you. Uh, it, but it won't be easy, by the way. They're not going to give you a pill. Yeah. that'll let you be in shape or a pill that will let you read Milton effortlessly. They will instruct you in the skills you need for these things. That's also deeply appealing to people. And I, I find um, it's just sort of an interesting um, tension there, right? We want to do the easy thing, which is to watch TikTok or scroll through Twitter or whatever it is. But if you tell me, uh, I know you can't climb Mount Kilimanjaro today, but if you follow these rules or this instructor it will be within your reach. That also deeply appeals to us. It, it does. Uh, yeah, I will say it, it, Milton is great and readable as long as Satan is talking. Uh, it's it's <laughs> it's when the good guys show up that it gets poor. Like I, I you know, the, the joke on Milton is that like he was the greatest gift to Satan in history. It's just like he did everything short of giving him a two-headed guitar. You know, it's just like Satan is so cool. Um, but <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, I, I I I know exactly what you mean, and and that goes back to this virtue of humility. Um, you know, you you can't you you can't teach yourself poetry, especially so, someone like Milton, who is indeed very dense and often uses this like syntax that can be confusing if you're not used to it. It does require that that person to sort of hold your hand and walk you through it until you you get strong at it, um, and that's a wonderful feeling. You know, and and then the the payoff again is like you get to read this. It's actually a, an incredible book. Uh, Paradise Lost is. I mean, the the vid, like I was just reading someone's commentary on. They're saying maybe it was Harold Bloom who was saying it's like it's like the first cinematic book. I and mean, when you read about the sort of massing of Satan's armies after they've been cast out, and they hold this like grand council, and then Satan talks about how he'll get on the throne and endure being in proximity to heaven as the leader. You know, it's just oh, it's so good. And but, it, but as you say, it's hard to read. It, it, you know, it, it, it helps to have read. Uh, I, I found it easier since making myself read Beowulf because uh, there, there's just certain syntactic things that are in epic that you have to get used to. But um, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's it's naturally community building when something is hard. Uh, let's close with uh, with Bea Wolf, your book. You did this. I think you say, and I believe you, that this was a labor of love. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't meant to be um, your next big thing. It was something you did because your daughter liked the idea of it and it spoke to you and it's deeply uh, thrilling that it speaks to anyone else. Um, talk about that kind of project. Um, it's, it's a wonderful thing. I'm, I'm it, so happy for you uh, that, that it, that it's a beautiful book. And um, so talk about that. Yeah, I the word I would use is it's been romantic uh, in, in the old sense of like, uh, 
uncanny almost. You know, he says, you know, before romantic meant shirtless guy on a book cover, it meant, you know, like Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote romances and Alec, uh, Edgar Allan Poe wrote romances. And that's, it feels like something strange has happened to me that I, that I have trouble. I, I, I've spent afternoons just kind of walking and wondering about it because I, I wrote this book. What I handed to Boulet was a column of words, just, just, just a poem, like a poem that is, is, is not from our millennium. Uh, I mean, it's got modern jokes and all that, but it's like this old style nobody reads anymore. It, we, the joke around the house was, you know, how we we're going to get rich with the 600 line unrhymed verse epic for eight year olds. Uh, and um, I thought it was a book, uh, Fabio Rojas, I don't know if you've ever interviewed him. He's a sociologist. And I was talking to him once and he, he said he always tells his students, write for the library, write for the library, write thinking that I'm going to do this right so that in 40 years, this lonely book of mine, someone's going to pick it up and say, ah, this answers the question I needed answered, and the conversation can continue in the future. And i that's how I thought about this book, um, because I thought, you know, I hoped we'd, you know, make enough money to maybe get to do a sequel or whatever it was, but I did not think, I thought most people would be baffled. And so it has been like the genuine shock of a lifetime, how many people not only enjoyed it, but enjoy it for the right reasons. Like they didn't, they, you know, you know, some people like enjoy it because they're jokes and it's about childhood but that, like, people told me they were genuinely moved by it. I, I, I've had several people tell me that if they had read it as teenagers, they would, it would have been formative for them, which was shocking to me because I, that was not at all my intention. Uh, and, and like, so I don't know. It's, it's, it's been just the, the most fascinating experience of my life. I feel like the world is very different than I thought it was. I think I had been way too cynical. I, I thought this kind of like the thing where a person, a regular person, could enjoy a poem was basically dead. Uh, and uh, I, I think like I told you, I'd, I'd, I'd done a joke about the Iliad on Twitter and I had a guy who was like, oh, I'm not a poetry guy, but this Iliad thing, that's uh, this is interesting. You know, <laughs> you're like, uh, what is what has happened? I think everybody thinks poetry is the the, the worst slam poetry thing you ever attended, uh, you know. But so the, the fact that you could come out with a book like this, that there is no other book like it, uh, not not in this millennium and that it's gotten like we're on our third printing and we haven't even. Uh, the book's not even out yet. Uh, and so I, I I don't know what to make of it. It's just been genuinely uh, and utterly magical. I don't know what, what the future holds, but it's been it's been the most wonderful experience, uh, at least career-wise, of my life. My guest today has been Zach Wiener-Smith. Zach, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks. It was, it was lovely. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>